So um, today we will be led in our discussion by Dr. Dr. Asare Amwa and then Dr. Daniel Yerkeri. And we're going to discuss qualitative research methods today. Uh, today, our director may join us later. He has an, another engagement in Accra. Mm. So I'd want to welcome Professor Kola to introduce us and welcome people on board so that we can start. We are 10 minutes into time. And so far, we have 65 members present now. So, Professor Kola, uh, yes. I think. <clears throat> Thank you. Welcome, Coordinator Dr. Tamanja. Uh, let me welcome all participants and, of course, especially the facilitators. On behalf of uh, Professor Yuvosana Mohamensa, our director, to this uh, sixth seminar series, which uh, Iris and the school for graduate uh, graduate school have put in place. As uh, we know, and uh, we started for the past uh, weeks, we know the importance of these um, seminars. And uh, <clears throat> I hope that our students, and of course we who are participants, will try as much as possible to gain what we can gain from these uh, seminars. And then of course, um, it seems to me that uh, this our seminars are becoming very popular, that uh, people all over the world are now participating and uh, we are going to make it better and better. And then let me request from the students to please send to the coordinator, Dr. Tamanja, your comments in case you have some advice for this, um, for this kind of a seminar for the future. So, to do much ado about nothing, <clears throat> please uh, welcome the facilitators, Dr. Asaria Moa and Dr. Yelpieri. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Paul, for your brief welcome. Um, Dr. Asaria Moa and then Dr. Yelpieri are respected research fellows uh, in IRIS. And then they will be helping us understand how to conduct qualitative research. Dr. Asari Amwa is the, currently the head of the Center for Education Policy Studies. And then Daniel, Dr. Kere is also in that same department. These are seasoned researchers. And so let us welcome Dr. Asari Amwa and then Dr. Kere in this discussion. Students, you are most welcome. And Dr. Asariyama and Dr. Daniel Kiri, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Professor Kula and then uh, Dr. Chamanda. Right. Uh, like you rightly said, we're going to give you short this time about qualitative research. Um, it's going to be in two parts. Um, I will start and then Dr. Yerke will also continue. All right. Um, like I said, the two of us are going to present, do the presentation, and then um, it's going to be two parts. I will start, and then Dr. Yerpe will also follow. Now, the present, overview of the presentation, uh, we'll first talk about learning outcomes, then uh, we'll talk about qualitative research, types of qualitative research, who undertake qualitative research, and what characteristics should a qualitative researcher possess. Then, that will be followed by some of the data collection instruments. Right. Now, the interaction, uh, we'll, pause, we'll pause and then maybe ask some few questions uh, to the participants um, to, to talk about. And as usual, if you want to talk, you need to raise up your hand and then we see uh, who is talking. Right. Now, the learning outcomes, at the end of this, we were expecting that you explicate the value of qualitative research as a rigorous process of scientific inquiry into contemporary issues. The interaction and contribution to the capacity building and qualitative research. So these are the two main learning outcomes um, underpinning this presentation. 
Right. The first, what is qualitative research? Um, we're giving two, uh, three, uh, three uh, issues of our qualitative research. The first is that it's about gaining in-depth understanding of human behavior and reasons that govern such behavior. That is by H.R. 2002. And again, we say that qualitative research provides understanding that of the ways people come to understand and act and manage the day-to-day -day situations in particular settings. So the emphasis is about particular setting. Again, consistent research produces information only on the particular case study. Any more general conclusions are only propositional informed assertion. This is by Willis 2001. So you could see that the um, interpretation I've given is a way of understanding a situation. And it gives a more general conclusions on the proportional informed assertions. So for qualitative research, we need to understand a situation. Try to understand it, um, get an in-depth understanding about situations in a particular setting. So that makes it a little bit different from quantitative uh, research. However, before, before you can understand qualitative research, well, as has been uh, um, said already, your ontological and epistemological stance provides a better understanding about whoever wants to do qualitative research. That is your ontology, uh, uh, getting understanding um, what, is, what exists by having an in-depth understanding or give you a thick description about situations, right? So basically that's what consensus research is all about. Then we move on to some of the types of qualitative research. Uh, we have ethnography, which will be explained later as we move along. We have phenomenology, we have case studies and the grounded theory. We're going to explain each one of them for you to understand what they mean. So that if you want to do, go into qualitative research, you know exactly what you, would, you should be doing. All right. We're doing it because uh, there's a big debate about between qualitative researchers and quantitative researchers. Um, the quantitative researchers think negatively about qualitative researchers, and the qualitative researchers also have issues with quantitative researchers. So we're doing this thing just to give us highlight about if you want to be a qualitative researcher, you know exactly what you need to do. Right. For ethnographic research, what we're saying is that in ethnography, it should develop an in-depth understanding of complex social and or cultural phenomena with these specific settings or groups through direct immersion and interactions. The interactions capture social meanings involving the researcher participating directly into the setting. These things, this idea has been, so what we're saying is that this idea has been um, echoed strongly by Margaret Mead, who, concepts, uh, who thinks that contemporary ethnography is based almost entirely on field work and requires a complete immersion of the um, who, he was an, an anthropologist in the culture and everyday lives of people who are the subject of his study. That means that if you want to get into, uh, if you want to use ethnography, you should immerse yourself into what is happening. I'll, I'll, I'll give an example very soon, and then we'll know 
how to approach um, uh, uh, such an issue, if you want to use, uh, what do you call it, uh, ethnography. So with ethnography, it's about getting yourself, moving the people, if you want to research uh, 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 people, having in mind their cultural underpinning and how they behave. I said, uh, uh, and in using ethnography as an example of uh, what do you call it, qualitative research, uh, as a designer of, for qualitative research, you need to get yourself involved. Be with them. You have to study them. And as we go along, we will we'll know how to get so much close to them, whether you have to be an outsider researcher or an insider researcher. We'll be talking about it as we move along. So if you want to use ethnography in qualitative research, get to the people, be with them. Stay with them, stay their cultural and opinion. Right. Then the other design, the other uh, uh, type, type of phenomenology. This one deals with the experiences and meanings of a phenomenon and the context within which the experience takes place. The context within which the experience takes place. What that means is that when you're talking about phenomenology, it derives an understanding of essential meaning as constructed through interpretation of people's life experience. So, and this has been, been championed by Edmund Hazel. They champion the issue of what? Phenomenology. So you see that with ethnography, you go is, is, is involved in the, with the people and then trying to look at uh, their culture and opinion how you are behaving, how things are moving, how the culture is influencing the way that they, they interact. Now, when I talk about uh, phenomenology, it's about getting their lives and living experiences, how they consider an issue, how they interpret an issue, how they get involved with that, with that issue. So that is uh, because, uh, like I said, from the start of uh, uh, qualitative uh, research, you need to get in-depth understanding of an issue in-depth understanding. And it is best to use, like, like I said earlier on, based on your ontological and then the, your epistemological stance. It's about using language, using words, using um, uh, issue and this is to explain issues. It's not about quantification. It's about getting better understanding and then explaining it. That's more about what qualitative research. That's what ethnography and Neurology are talking about. The next is about case studies. Thus, the case study is simply an in depth and thick description of events and can be descriptive, exploratory, or explanatory. Yes, we'll talk more about it. I know when, um, when it's time to ask questions, we explain most of these things. You need to be exploring, you need to be explaining, and then it's about in-depth and thick description of issues, getting deep, deep, deep down to get meaning about how people are behaving. And then we have the greater theory concept. This is about studying a phenomenon, developing theories out of it, based on the experiences and the perceptions of individuals. So you want to find out why I, I like Yoko Gary? Yes, you need to get closer to me. We see what I'll say, we develop theories from it based on the experiences that I'll tell you why I, I like your Gary and not Fufu. So, Gary theory is also one of the, um, the types of what qualitative research that we normally embark ourselves uh, in. Having talked about that, the next thing I'll talk about is I'll pose this to you. I explore the challenges facing teenage mothers in schools in your own way. What type of qualitative study would be appropriate for this? But a few things that I've said already, exploring the challenges facing teenage mothers in schools. Will it be ethnography? Will it be phenomenological? Will it be case study? Will it be the grander theory? Depending on the focus of your study, depending on how you want to get issues, depending on how you want to understand what issue is it. Look for this, challenges facing teenage mothers. If there's a, there's a need to get closer to them, you live with them, 
you immerse yourself in all that, all activities that are involved to understand them, then you go for what? The ethnographic type of work study. On the other hand, if you want to, to, to get your living experiences, if that's your focus, if you're focused to get the living experiences of these teenage mothers, if you want to get more, hear more about these teenage mothers, then the listen is to go for what? Uh, phenomenology. On the other hand, if you want to uh, study a few of them, one or two of them, and get in-depth understanding about how some of the problems that they are, uh, they are facing, depending on the samples that we choose, what we'll be talking about later, then what do we need to do? It becomes a case study. Or you want to develop theory, you want to develop some theory about how teenage mothers face challenges. Uh, so you're going to use uh, the gravity. All I'm saying is that whatever I want to do, depending on the purpose of your study, depending on the focus of your study, you need to identify one of them. Then how do you do this? You can only do this like um, my co this thing presented uh, last week. You need to sit and read. You sit and read and read and read for you to understand your focus and to get to your focus. Otherwise, you start and at a point in time, <laughs> you see that you'll be struggling, trying to, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, trying to change your permanent. In quantitative research, get a focus. Otherwise, most of us, most of us are used to this quantitative, uh, this and then most of the time, so then who uh, tend to go quantitative, they end up rather uh, 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 entering to the quantitative side of our study. That is, if you don't understand it, then you are in trouble. That is what happens. Again, who, who, and I take quantitative research. You should have that philosophy that I'm going to search for the reality and the reality can only be achieved with thick description of events. If that's your philosophy, then you can do quantitative. And again, the, this session should attempt to assess the thought and feelings of study participants. Because about thought and feelings of study participants, you need to know what you're looking for. What is in their mind? Their life experiences. Get yourself immense. How are the culture and opinions supporting them? We need to have this, you don't understand this before you uh, venture into qualitative research. Again, you should be able to safeguard participants and data. You know, um, qualitative research, we tend to get closer to the participant. We tend to leave the participant. We tend to interact more with the participant. I know research, one of the critical things about research is that it harms the participants a lot. It invades individuals' privacy. It, it allows individuals to open up to us. So if you have, if you have the skill to safeguard the participant, to ensure confidentiality is adhered to. Because if you don't do that, and you, you let go every time you hear from the participant, then what happens? You are destroying the participant. The very people who are supporting you to do the study, you try to what? Uh, expose them. It's very, very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Again, you should understand your positionality. What is positionality? How do you position yourself in the study that you're doing? Like I said, in qualitative research, you get closer to the uh, 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 participant. Are you going to engage them and then let your, your inner distinct influence the data that you are collecting? As a researcher, you need to be very objective. Are you going to get yourself with the people and collect data of them? Or you stay outside and then try to get information from them? So positionality is very, very, very crucial. If you are an insider researcher, 
your personality is going to influence the data. If you're an outsider researcher, what are some of the things that you do that you get objective data? So your positionality is very, 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 you need to understand yourself. You need to understand your positionality. Or you embark on, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, qualitative research. Otherwise, you go there, you compromise the data. I would do a study involving teachers. And it was um, um, uh, 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 an ethnographic type of a study. One of the teachers later identified that I was also a teacher. There were things that we were doing that were trying to find out from me. Whether what we were doing was right or wrong. As a researcher, I had to be, I, I need to just let them know that we are all learning and we are all trying to. Because the moment you agree that you are a teacher and they are also teachers and then because of your, uh, what do you call it, your position, they may think that you, you are there to maybe monitor or evaluate them. So you need to be very careful. If you're doing qualitative research because you get closer to the people, so your positional your position should be well should be well defined before you start. If you think that you are going to be with them, fine, you can be with them, but make sure that you don't implement the data that you get. I've said etc. etc. Why etc. etc. There are other issues. There are other characters that a qualitative researcher should be should uh, acquire. One is that it should be a technical reader and a critical writer. Are you a critical reader? Are you a critical writer? What I mean by critical reader is that do you, how, how are you following arguments that are put up? Because we go to a place to collect data and there may be a participant maybe coming out of some argument. How are you following the argument of the researcher? In view of the fact that whatever that, they be, uh, that uh, the participant may be saying may not be whatever that you require, you require, you need to be a critical listener. You need to be a critical reader, a writer. To be a qualitative researcher, you should be able to write. When you're doing qualitative research, and you think that uh, you have about one A4, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, a book. That A4 book and you think that will be enough, my friend. You better think that because you need to be writing. You write and write, you write, you cross, you write, you cross, you develop argument, systematic argument, because you are reporting from an event. And you need to have that skill. If you don't have that skill, then you're in trouble. You should be able to sit. You don't have to behave like a grasshopper. Some qualitative researchers, they sit at the last minute, they start to put it together. You read the stuff that they bring and you see that consistency is a problem. As a qualitative researcher, one of the critical is that you should be able to wrestle with ideas. Yes, you go somewhere saying this. Yes, you've reported the very much. How, what interpretation are you giving to that information that you've got, you've gotten from the participant? You need to rest over a lot of ideas. As a qualitative researcher, like I said, you have to sit, pin your bottles on the chair, read, read, and write. And every step in qualitative research, you need to write it. For example, you go to the field, you order to collect data from one participant. The participant says, uh, for this particular hour, I'm not ready. I'll meet you in the next hour. When you are reporting, you need to give that vivid so that people will understand. Because the quantitative researchers are saying that, oh, I'm a quantitative researcher. They are, they are what? Uh, it's about uh, subjectivity. They can even go ahead in the corner and then tell us stories. But it is not about that. It's about letting individuals understand whatever went into the work. Rest of ideas. Should be a critical reader. Should be a critical writer. You don't have these capabilities. It will be very difficult for you to be a very good qualitative researcher. You should have command of the language that you are using. How to, to be a critical uh, uh, writer and reader. I can't remember. I was doing a study of um, some qualitative study of 
a white man. I sat there the whole night to bring out a piece about four page. Uh, this thing I went, he read it, and he said, you, 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 you don't know English. I said, ah, when I've sat there for the whole night to write this, they're telling me I don't know English. All that I was saying that, even though I had ideas, but I wasn't able to wrestle out the ideas, try to put the ideas in some logical form for people to understand it. Because you are not there, whoever is reading is not there. So you need to ensure that whatever that you put down is what happened. It has some strengths, but it has some strengths and some limitations. So the trends are as follows. For qualitative research, it will provide more detailed information to explain complex issues. We use multiple because we want every uh, information that we get to be that uh, so objective. We use multiple methods for gathering data on sensitive subjects. There are times a particular strategy may not be helpful in getting a particular data. You use multiple of them for triangulation and for uh, objectivity purpose. I say something, the coordinator says another thing, Dracula says the same thing in different ways. We need to see and see how best we can do. And data collection is usually cost effective. Some of my limitations over there are it's more difficult to analyze. And then data collection, most of the time, is time consuming. Time consuming. I haven't talked about this. I will let my co presenter give you some details about some of the methods that we use in collecting data. And then we will pause and then wait for questions from the floor where detailed explanation can be given of some of the things that will be said that you may need further clarification. So on this note, I hand over to Dr. Uh, Daniel. Okay, thank you, uh, my co-presenter, uh, Dr. Asari. Yes, uh, so far we have gotten to we want to look at some of the uh, methods that are usually used in collecting data in qualitative research. But before we go to that, uh, we need to ask ourselves, uh, what type of data do we want to collect? if only we have already formulated uh, research questions. You look at the research questions, and based on that, that should inform you the type of data that you want to collect, either primary data or secondary data. That's very, very important. If you want to collect primary data, then it means you need to talk to people. You need to talk to people, be it group or individuals. You need to visit institutions, organizations to talk to people. You need to visit places, especially your study area, to talk to people. And more importantly, uh, to get good knowledge about your study place. Like you said, because in qualitative research, detail is very, very important. So when we uh, Dealing with primary data, we must bear in mind that we can use interview, focus group discussion, reflective dialogue, observation, and others. But what we are presenting here is not exhaustive. We are just selected some of them. So there are more for you to read. Then if you want to look at secondary data, then that one to look at secondary data sources or secondary data analysis, and then documentary sources. So these are the two main data that you must always have in mind if you want to do qualitative research. So we take them one after the other and see how best we can uh, explain them. So we take interview. An interview is a, 
a data collection process whereby the researcher engages a participant or a respondent by asking him or her questions to enable him to understand the phenomena that he has engaged himself into studying. And that is, uh, we know uh, interview as it is, is based on one-on-one -on -one basis. But then let's look at the process first. It, is, it usually involves a face-to-face -face interaction between the interviewer and then the interviewee or the respondents. And then an interview guide is usually prepared. In some books, they will say interview schedule is prepared. And this gives the interview process focus, direction, so that you know what exactly you are studying. Then it can be done also through telephone. The telephone interview is possible. Even some books you will see that, that the interview can be done through the next computer. <clears throat> we want to look at types of interview that we have. Now the structure type, and this usually follow a set of specific questions prepared to guide the interaction. In fact, the structure type in other books we say standard interview. And that one, the questions are prepared, what you call interview guide or shadow, are prepared to guide the interviewer in asking his or her questions. Uh, for example, uh, if I'm doing a study on teacher attraction and I want to know, I ask a question like, what are some of the causes of teacher attraction in your study area or in the uh, school community? You see, that is a question, an interview question. That will guide the study. And then you have semi-structured interview. It usually uses themes or issues rather than specific questions. However, that is not to say that you can't use questions. You can still use questions like I've given. But then the most important thing that you need to know about semi-structured interview is that it provides an opportunity for the interviewer to probe further, to ask further questions based on the responses of what the interviewee, especially if the question, the response is not very clear, focused, then you based on that, ask questions so as to enable the respondents to provide uh, the exact answer that he expects. Then third one, unstructured interview does not follow any predetermined pattern or questions or teams. Yes, that is, in some books you see that uh, they call in-depth interview, some intensive uh, interview and what have you. But then unstructured interview it's more conversational. You introduce the issue and the person that you are interviewing has to talk, talk about the issue. You talk more and more about the issue. And as he talks, you, the interviewer, must be taking note of some of the essential things that he's raising so that when you come to the transcription, you transcribe those things. Because as he talks, there, there, there's more likelihood that some of the things that he may talk may not be necessary for your study. But then you give him the free hand to talk on the issue that you are studying on. <clears throat> so we look at the advantages of and disadvantages of interview. It gives high rate of response as well as the ability of the researcher to modify and clarify questions. Yes, because you, the researcher, you are sitting right there. That's why you say one of one before the interviewee. So if there's any difficulty with respect to the question you ask, then he can ask you for clarification for you to clarify the question before he answers. That is very, very important. The interviewer has control over respondent selection and can modify questions. Yes. The interviewer selects who should uh, respond to his questions. And that gives him the advantage of selecting people who are knowledgeable in the area, who have the expertise, who have the experience. So that's why usually in qualitative research or in such studies, you do purposive uh, selection or sampling when it comes to selecting your respondents. 
so that you know people who have the expertise, who can give you the right information. And then, uh, like we said, you can also modify your questions depending on the person you are interviewing and the person's level of understanding and dealing. It also assures a high rate of confidentiality of information provided by the respondent. Yes, as, as one of the ethics of research, you as a researcher, you go to and treat somebody to help you with information to do your research, whether your PhD or MQ or whatever, which after that you will be a big man betraying your weight about. So under no circumstance, should you betray the person by uh, revealing or uh, 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 giving the information he has given you to a third party? You must be very, very confidential with the information he has given you. He has done a big favor. Disadvantages. Face-to-face -face interviews are expensive and time-consuming. You don't need to argue about that. Very, very time-consuming. You need to be patient, take your time, especially you'll be recording. If you are not recording, you don't have the gadgets to record and you have to struggle to uh, scribble it down. You can imagine the time that you spend. It takes time and resources to arrange the session and may involve traveling and lodging. Yes, that is to say that if your respondents are not in the same community that the researcher you are, then it means you have to travel. That is money, that is time. And perhaps you may even get there and the person is busy somewhere, you see? So you need time, you need to be patient. And more so, sometimes it may require that you have to book a hotel accommodation. Assuming you are to interview somebody at Kumasi, from Winneba to Kumasi, you can't leave the same day and expect to be there and then you must go and lodge in a hotel a day before so that you can meet the person at the right time, yes. So finance is also a factor you need to consider. Time and resources will be required to train data collection assistants, yes. Sometimes your study may be so big that you as an individual researcher, you can't do it all. You need people to help, you need helping hands. And those people who are coming to help with research assistants you need to spend time and resources to train them, to acquire the skills that will enable them to collect the right data for you. Otherwise, you'll be in a mess. And then sometimes by the nature, very nature of uh, interview, you have some challenges like psychological issues. You may select a respondent or an interviewee that you want to interview, and that person may have his own problems that you, you as a researcher may not know, and may mistake or unknowingly ask certain questions that may not uh, go down well with the person and may arouse certain emotions, uh, especially assuming you are interviewing a student who has recently lost uh, a, 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 a benefactor who is sponsoring him or her, and you go and ask such a question, and certainly, certainly it will arouse emotions and the person may begin to cry or may not feel well. That is another thing. So we must be very, very careful with the type of questions that we ask uh, our respondents. Then last but not the least, reactive issues. Very often we go to interview people uh, let's assume that perhaps the person you are interviewing, you have not, you might have not given the person a full knowledge about the type of uh, study that you are doing, and for that matter, the type of questions you are going to answer. And therefore, when you go and ask some of the questions, sometimes the person may not have adequate knowledge or information to give you the right response and therefore the, the question, the answer and the response you may get may be there and there based on what he knows and not necessarily what you may be looking for. So it's more reactive, uh, what is it, response that the person may give you, which 
uh, you must also know, and then possibly a profiler. <clears throat> Telephonic interview, that's the next type. This is conducted through telephone whenever it is not possible to meet the respondents physically. And for uh, certain reasons beyond your control, you may have to do the interview uh, by the use of telephone, especially it may be distance or it may be uh, the geographical location of uh, the respondents, especially those, uh, assuming you want to interview somebody who is at the overseas, like a firm place, and it's difficult for you to reach the person, but then it's easy for you to interview the person through the use of the interview uh, telephone, that is perfect. It is usually carried out from central office that places telephone calls to selected respondents. In other words, um, the interviewer must make sure that he is at a central place, that's an office, where he can call the person for the person to respond to. And the person must, uh, based on the appointment you have with the person, must also be at a central point, either at office or home, so that uh, you can do the interview comfortably without any interruptions. Otherwise, assuming during the appointed time, you, the interviewer, you are at a lorry station, it is not possible for you to do that. There will be interruptions here and there. Or uh, if the uh, interviewee is at a marketplace, so we must always agree on a time and then the place. Then uh, advantages and disadvantages of telephonic interview. <clears throat> Excuse me. It leads to good response rates, fast and has control over the selection of respondents. I will explain this before. Because the researcher has control over selection of respondents, uh, and also because he also goes to them or uh, agree with them be before the interview session, usually the response rate is always favorable. And for that matter, uh, because it's also uh, telephonic, the, it's also fast and then uh, it's very convenient in that case. It is more economical because it eliminates travel and lodging cost to the researcher. We have explained this before. It enables the researcher to reach respondents at hard to reach areas and a wider geographical area. Okay. The disadvantages include interviews could be interrupted due to technical challenges such as network failure or poor quality and interruptions in the conversations. Yes, if you are not at an office or a place, a quiet place, and you are at home, or even sometimes in your office, there can be interruptions. Some people will just bump in if they don't know that you are busily engaged on the telephone. Uh, interview, yes, it happens. It cannot control interruption by others in household or office, yes. If you are also interviewing at home or if the re respondent is at home, interruption can also take place. Hard to find persons at home or offices for interview. Yes, sometimes when you go to people's office, you want to uh, it's not that easy. Sometimes you have to go, come, go, come, even at home. It's not that easy. But then you need to be patient with your respondents. Yes, that is one quality you must have. It requires training and quality control. Yes. So the, uh, uh, it means that there is an additional cost with respect to training that you as a... Uh, a researcher need to give your research assistant. <clears throat> then let's look at interview checklists or things that you need to plan to enable you to do a very good or plan a very good interview. You need to take note of these. First, decide what you need to know. Yes, like I said, you have 
your research questions ready. Look at your research questions. And then what exactly do I need to know or do I need for this particular study? List all the items about which information is required. You need to list all of them, the things that you need to collect information on. Ask yourself why you need such information. Why do I need them? What will I use this information for? You need to probe yourself. Examine your list and then remove any item that is not directly associated with the study. Yes. The first place, the first instance that you plan, there's a likelihood that you may include certain issues or items that may not uh, burden up. Or second thought, you may realize that they are not necessary. So you have to, yes. So it, that is part of it. Then decide the type of interview that you want to use. Is it structured, semi-structured, unstructured? You need to decide, considering uh, the, kind of, the kind of data you want to collect and the, the research questions you have. You need to look at that. And that will help you. And then refine your questions. Write questions on cars or a check wording. Yes, you must always make sure that you have written your questions down on a paper. And then you must check the wording of your questions to ensure that it really convey the meaning that you want to, or the question that you want to ask. Prepare an interview guide. Prepare and interview. Consider the order of the questions. Prepare prompts in case the respondent does not provide essential information, yes. You need to prepare an interview guide and then the, is asking that you must also include prompts. Prompts here means suggested answers that you, the interviewer, must prepare. Something like options. Assuming that you ask the question, and then the interview, interviewee is struggling with it. You need to provide some prompts so that the interviewer and the interviewee will select. And in the use of this prompt, you must make sure that the, prompt, the same prompt is given to all respondents throughout. <clears throat> that is very important. Pilot your schedule. You need to uh, try out your questions, the interview schedules, before you go to the field to uh, collect data with it. You can do this if you're a teacher with any of your colleagues about two, three of them. You send your questions to them, you ask them to give you some time, you ask them the questions, and then they will respond to the questions. And that will help you to know whether the questions you are framed are really eliciting the right responses or not. Where there are difficulties, you are, if your police will make comments or will assist you to reword them to get the right uh, questions so that it can elicit the right uh, responses that you need. Revise the shadow if necessary. That is to say that if uh, they are not eliciting the right responses. Do, do your best to avoid bias. That is very, very important. As a researcher, everybody enters into the research situation with some bias. Uh, already before you even started the study, you had your own perceptions about the issue you are going to study. And therefore, as much as possible, try to avoid a situation where your personal biases will enter or influence the data that you are collecting. That is very important. Select who to interview. Yes, it is your duty as a uh, listening uh, interviewer to select people or respondents, and you must always be reasonable in the selection of respondents, uh, that the, the number of respondents must be representative, especially in qualitative research. You don't need to bite so much. If you do bite so much, you will find it very, very difficult to handle the data because you, at the end of the day, have access to copious information that you will not be able to handle. And that, as a result, that may affect the outcome of the final report because you will not be able to do justice to it. So be very, very careful. 
and then be very realistic, especially uh, first time researchers. We are always ambitious, we buy so much. Then introduce yourself, explain the purpose of the research, even if you have a letter. When you visit the school, especially the first visits, you must introduce yourself to the people you are going to collect data from, then let them know the purpose of the uh, uh, study. That's, uh, you also assure them of confidentiality and anonymity, which are very important uh, issues that must be observed. Say how long the interview will last. Yes, and sometimes uh, you might have done it before, so you know how long it is going to the duration of the interview because you are going to take somebody's time, especially when you visit school or you go to somebody's office. The person is on official duty, and therefore you don't have to take so much of it. You tell, oh, this will not last or not take so much time. So I beg you, uh, I'll need about 20 minutes of your time or 30 minutes of your time, and you work within that uh, time. <clears throat> Decide whether to tape record the interview. Yes, you, like I said, if you are not good in writing, very fast in writing, you will struggle and at the end of the day, you end up not taking all the information that you need. So you must not hide to record. Inform the interviewee that for this reason, I want to tape record whatever you see. But then after using it for my, uh, you have already assured the person of confidentiality and, and then want, after using it for the work that I'm doing, all the information will be destroyed from the tape. That is very essential. Then, uh, common sense and good manners will take you a long way. People you agree to, people who agree to be interviewed are doing a favor they are doing a favor, and therefore you must, I mean, respect them and treat them well, so that uh, next time you want to collect data or somebody else want to collect data, uh, that person will be given the opportunity. You must, I mean, they, they are doing you a favor, and therefore you must be very pleasant to them. Remember to adhere to shadow meetings. Yes, if you have appointments, please be very, very punctual, uh, uh, be on time so that uh, you can do it in a given time because the person you are going to interview might have uh, 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 been booked for something else or going to teach, so to speak. But because of you, he has given the time and therefore you must make sure that you make good use of it. So these are some of the uh, that list or things that you must plan when you are going to do an interview. Okay, so we are finished with interview. We want to look at another method that is focus group discussion. A focus group discussion is also a type of interview, as you know, uh, you'll get to know very soon. It's also a type of interview. It is a group research method that focuses on the group's view, attitudes, experience and beliefs. Let's take note of these words. It focuses on the group's view, attitudes, experience and beliefs. Very, very important. So it means that the group that we are going to involve in the focus group discussion should have similar characteristics, so to speak. It is also a form of group interview in which more than one person, at least four, is interviewed. It is usually led by a moderator. It can be the researcher or somebody that the researcher may appoint who moderates the session. The discussion places emphasis on a defined or given issue or topic. That is to say that the discussion that you are going to engage the group in is meant to help you to collect data for your study, and therefore the discussion should be focused on the issue that you are studying. So the emphasis should be on that. 
a close attention is normally paid to the interaction within the group so that opinions on the um, uh, opinions of the participants emerge in a joint construction of meaning that the discussion plays no that a close attention is normally paid to the interaction that is to say that what the group uh, what is the members do the interactions the discussions that they do between the, the members of the group is very very important they discuss because we said that they have certain things in common they have certain characteristics opinions attitudes and experience and therefore they, they, they interact they share their opinion and that opinions that they share emerge in a joint construction of meaning let me say that the, the, the discussion come out clearly to represent the collective view of what the group so that is what that means and so focus group discussion allows access to respondents who may not be comfortable with the interview session because of its one-on-one -on -one interactions with the researcher. Oh yes, some people <laughs> don't like <laughs> interview one-on-one -on -one interviews. No, you go and they'll be giving excuses here and there. Yes, so uh, those such people are usually comfortable with the focus group discussion because that one is a group collective something, and therefore they share and. That is good. <clears throat> and then the focus group has two methods, which means, which include the group interview, like I said earlier, focus group uh, also is an interview. So the group interview in which a number of participants deliberate on a number of issues. Yes, a group interview is there. Maybe four, five people who have been interviewed by the interviewer. That one is a pure interview, except that it's a group interview. It's not one-on-one, -on -one. it's a group interview. And then the second method is, in the case of focus interview, interviewees are selected because they are known to have been involved, emphasis on that, in a particular situation. Let's say that the people that you have selected have been selected for a particular reason because they have common, what is it, characteristics. Because they are involved, they have been involved in a particular situation that you want them to share with you. Uh, for example, let's use, uh, uh, in the wake of the coronavirus, <laughs> people who, who travel from abroad into the country, as at the time that uh, we closed down the country, those people were made to go into quarantine. They were quarantined. In fact, it was a unpleasant situation, but they had no option. They had to, I mean, bear it. So such people, assuming you are doing a study on coronavirus and you need such people, you need to select them. You must especially select set people so that they share with you that special experience they had while in quarantine. Can you imagine that? The anxiety and the sleepless nights. <laughs> that comes with it. So that they share with you. So that is the, the involvement we are talking about. Oh, well, you want to do a study on examination or practices and it's effects on um outcomes or examination outcomes assuming a student who recently wrote the uh, what, what do you call the wasi exams and we heard about examination leakages here and there and some of the papers were cancelled so you put yourself in the shoes of such students and the papers though those who were cancelled were to be rewritten so you want to get those students who rewrote those papers and then let them share their experience what they went through when they were waiting for those papers to be uh, rewritten the anxiety the sleepless nights and all that they went through the torture and how it affected what the outcome of the uh, exams 
that is also another example. I think that will throw more light on it. <clears throat> then the selected people are asked to discuss that involvement. I've already explained, so no qualms. Moderators are more interested in the joint construction of meaning. Yes. So as they interact and exchange ideas, they put the ideas together. Yes. We, 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 we said that they agreed on the issues, their experiences. And that is what the researcher is interested in, the grand construction of meaning, the agreement that they come into. Hmm? Yeah, that common experience, that is very, very important. And that is what the researcher needs. Some of the advantages that we can talk of, it gives people who are known to have had certain experiences the opportunity to be interviewed in a relatively unstructured way or unstructured way of the of that experience yes those people who have had such an experience i mean are given the opportunity then they share that experience for whoever want to have it to learn from it uh, to have it it provides insights into a team that might not be obtained in an interview session since many participants share their views. Yes, it affords the interviewer the opportunity for many people to share their view on the issue. Focus group offers the researcher the opportunity to study the, to study the ways in which individuals collectively make sense of the phenomena uh, and construct meanings around it. Yes as they give them the opportunity as individuals who come together to share and then, like I said, construct meaning around the phenomena or the issue that they have experienced to make something meaningful to themselves and to whoever needs such an information. I think that is the end of, oh, okay, it has also got some disadvantage. Uh, the researcher usually has less control over the proceedings done with the individual interviewer. And that's, the data are difficult to analyze because a large amount of data can easily be generated, yes. Because people will talk, argument here and there, you have to present. So at the end of the day, you might have collected a whole chunk of what data that you have to deal with. And that is one disadvantage. <clears throat> hmm. Okay, so that ends focus group discussion. Then let's look at reflective dialogue. Reflective dialogue as one of the uh, methods. So it's a process that gives an opportunity to individuals to bring their expertise to an endeavor that is potentially enriching to all involved. Hmm. I like that. As a process that gives an opportunity to individuals. In fact, I must say that this reflective dialogue is almost the same as the, the method is almost the same as the focus group discussion. Uh, as we look at it, we get to know it. So here I said individuals are brought together and they bring with them their expertise to an endeavor that is potentially enriching to all involved. In, in other words, these people are experts and they bring that expertise and experience together. And these expertise and experience that they bring together have the potential of enriching or making other members of the group better because they learn from what? each other, they share expertise, they share experience, skills, and that's make the group work better. That's enriching to all involved. Then Hatton and Smith have also pointed out that reflective dialogue allows individuals to think and resolve an issue which involves active chaining, a careful ordering of ideas, linking each with its Predecessor. Hmm. That is a mouthful of words. 
linking that's a chaining. He's talking about that the individuals involved in the dialogue, in the discussion, we said earlier that they are experts and they bring to the discussion with their expertise, their experience to resolve an issue which involves active chaining, a careful ordering of ideas linking each other with its predecessor. Here it's talking about chaining meaning that related issues, the issues that you are going to uh, deliberate on are issues that are related. So they have to deal with the main issue, the main concepts, and then it's related what? Concepts. So as to digest the issue and to make it comprehensible. So in effect, these experts come together and they dissect the issues and then make sure that they do justice to the issue at stake. Huh. Usually it involves about four or more members and they set their own agenda on the issue. For example, if the research is about quality of education, you see, so that's why we say that the people who are brought together, who are selected to participate are experts. You must be an expert. You must have a good knowledge and experience in the area before you can do justice to such a topic. Quality of education. When we talk about quality of education, what exactly do we mean? Mm? It's a multifaceted or a broad, what is it, concepts. So assuming you pick people on the street to do a reflective dialogue and say a discussion on this, it's going to be a problem. So you need experts, at least head teachers, eh? teachers or directors of education and people who are well endowed in the area, who have expertise and experience so that they can digest this. Because when we talk about quality of education, there are so many things that you need to uh, think about. For example, you need to think about the curriculum or content or what we call syllabus. That is first. Is it relevant to the people that were delivering that type of education to? Yes, that must be considered. Huh. The infrastructure, is it up to standard? Not mischief structures. The teaching and learning materials, are they there? Are they there? What about quality of teachers? You know, these are some of the things that you must look at. So if you pick anybody on the street, they can't do justice to this. So that's why you need experts. The researcher has no control on the agenda for discussion, no. The moment you select them, you as a researcher, your work is done. You'll be a standby while they discuss, they digest issues one after the other. Whilst you look at the researcher or a selected individual acts as the facilitator or the moderator for the interaction. That's the researcher, yes, you can facilitate. So that when they are going out or outside and be engaging in something that is not necessary, you bring them back, you draw their attention to come back. Yes, that one you can do. <laughs> Factors influencing reflective dialogue. Individuals involved should have rich understanding of issues to be discussed. We have explained that the respondents or for that matter participants must have very good understanding knowledge about the issue to be discussed. The facilitator should be neutral and only try to bring discussion into focus when it is sidetracking. Oh, I have already said that one. Ground rules must be made. Members need to set ground rules to guide their interactions, especially turn taking. Yes. Yes. It's such a group coming together to work as a group, especially with respect to such an important issue. You need to agree on some rules to guide them. It should not be everybody talking at the same time. You must be taking turns. When one person put up his, man, uh, his hand and wants to have his turn, let me or her have his turn and talk. Then how do we reach consensus? I mean, such rules should be, 
And we must respect each other's what? View. Each other's view must be respected. Yes, especially initially when you are bringing out, you are developing ideas, like we, we do in brainstorming. All the ideas that are brought, that are religious, must be written down. Must be written down. That is saying you respect the view. And then later, when you are going over to see the, 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 the veracity or the strength of those points, sometimes you can delete some of them. Yes, but then you need to respect people's opinion. Then the other of activities. Teams identified for the discussion need to be organized to avoid overlapping of discussion. Yes, we agree on the teams, like we said, we have the main, the top, 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 the team. Yes, you need to arrange them such a way that when you finish with one, then you move to the other. You don't lump them together so that everything will be done orderly. <sighs> Okay, so that is that for reflective dialogue. Now I want to look at another method, that is observation. Uh, observation too is a very common um, tool or for that matter method that is usually used in research, in the sciences and then in social sciences. Yes, and then say so it involves the use of human eyes, or optical device to capture data for use in a research. So you must note human eyes and optical devices that are usually used uh, to collect data when it comes to observation. So we'll talk about optical device, you know what I'm talking about, like camera, can be video or even now, these days we use our phones. So we don't have so much problem when it comes to data collection. You can use your phone if you have a digital phone. Then the phenomena of interest could also be captured using optical devices such as, okay, I've already mentioned that. The researcher could also structure the, observational, the observation by using an observation checklist. Yes, that is also another method or way uh, to capture your information using observation checklist. And then the data that you usually use by, uh, capture by usually using observation checklist or shadow uh, is usually referred to as structural observation and that data can easily be converted to numeric uh, data uh, and is usually used in quantitative research. Yes. <clears throat> Let's look at types of observation. We have one, participant's observation. It's a process whereby the observer is part of the group that he or she is observing. Let's say that the person who is doing the observation is an insider. Is part of the group that is observing. Uh, this method of participant observation is usually used in qualitative research uh, and it requires a relatively long period of immersion of the observer in a social setting. And in other words, this method is very, very appropriate for ethnographical study, like my colleague said, a participant observation, because you need details. You need to know the cultural, social values of the people. And therefore, it requires that you go and stay with them or you live with them for a long period of time to study all those things through observation, video collection and tape recording, and even interviews. That will help you to get that. So that's participant observation. And we say that a classic example of a participant observer could be a classroom teacher. Yes, a classroom teacher, because a teacher in a class, we've said over and over again that must be someone who knows his people or his students very, very well. So that is one of the tools or methods that you can use to know your students. You are there with them. They don't know that you are noting them, you are, you are observing them, you are taking note of their behaviors and all that. 
That is a good teacher. So a, a good example is a, a classroom teacher. Or you can also say a police CID. A police CID is also sometimes come <coughs> an investigative CID can be a participant observer, especially when there is a crime and they need to investigate a crime. Someone can be detailed to go and stay at where the crime took place. That community can stay there for months, for years, all with the intention of what, collecting data. As for them, they will say collecting what, a gathering of intelligence. That's the language they use. So you'll be there for years and be collecting data, be visiting uh, beer bars where people sit down and then when they become TC, they talk about sensitive issues. <laughs> you'll be collecting all those. You'll be visiting places like where people play drugs and they talk about things and what are you. So these are some of the uh, methods that they use. <clears throat> the non-participant observation, on the other hand, it's a situation where the observer observes but does not participate in the activities or whatever is going on in the social setting. Yeah. He's observing, but then he's not a, a member of the group that he's observing. So he's just an outsider. He observes from outside. Uh, we have an example, like in the school environment. Uh, during break time, when the children are playing outside, the teachers are there, they will be observing them. Yes, they, they are not part of the, the children playing, but they, they will be observing all that the children do at the playground. That is an example of a non-participant observer. You, you can cite more of them. <clears throat> then, I see, I see, uh, this thing is not good. This is not a good. Yes. So we also come to forms of observation. Structured observers are usually participants because they are in the social setting that is being observed, but hardly participate in what is happening. You see, so here the observer, like we said, like the, the school situation, the teachers are observing children playing. They, they take notes, perhaps they have prepared their checklist and they'll be taking the kind of behavior that the children are exhibiting on the playground. Those who are fighting, they will know that, or they'll be telling. And then they'll be also observing those who are doing group work, perhaps playing and pay, that is a group play. They'll be taking all those. Those who are perhaps, I mean, playing various of forms of games or those who are engaging in some social activity, they'll be telling all those things. And at the end of the day, they will know the type of behavior children put up outside the class. And that gives them a good picture about them. So that is a structured observation. Then unstructured observation is whereby the observation does not involve the use of observation shadow, where specific listed activities or behaviors are observed. Yes, unstructured observation here, it means that the person who is doing the observation does not actually observe according to any shadow. That is to say that he does general observation. He observes whatever takes place during the uh, children play at the playground. Whatever. He takes note of everything. So in, in effect, the unstructured type of observation uh, uh, give uh, uh, the observer uh, a broader perspective of our children's behavior. Yes. Uh, in fact, the, we had a little challenge with our slides. Uh, some of the types of uh, observations were added to uh, <clears throat> the forms. So later, you rearrange them and then resubmit 
the slides to them so that you have the right uh, information. So if I may go back to the types, the third type is simple observation. It's a situation where the observer has no influence over what she or he is observing. Yes, so the, the, the observer here, uh, in some books you see uh, direct observation instead of simple observation, they are the same. Here the observer observes a special inanimate objects, objects or non-living things. For example, in the school situation, you'll be observing school facilities like classroom, the nature, it states, uh, the, 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 the chalkboard, how does it look like? Uh, formerly, we used to have a blackboard. But when you see some of them, uh, you uh, better refer to them as whiteboard. They are paid that and they are, cannot be referred to as blackboard. So you observe objects, things. That's, in fact, uh, your present there cannot change the state of it. Then we have contrived observation. Is the direct opposite of simple observation because in this case, the observer actively changes the situation in order to observe effects of an intervention. In fact, uh, contrived observation here is more of an experimental uh, procedure, a, a method that is usually used in experimental study. Let's say that the experimenter in a way put certain things in place to change uh, uh, what, what do you call it? The situation so that uh, he put in interventions so as to ensure that he gets the right information or data, he collects the right data that he wants. Then we talk about observation shadow. Uh, like we did in the interview, in the case of the interview, you need to also plan before you go out to observe. And some of the things that you need to bear in mind in terms of planning are decide exactly what you need to know. What do I want to collect in terms of uh, observing what I want to observe? List all topics or aspects of the information required. You need to list all the things that you want to uh, observe. Consider why you need such information. Why do I need them? What will I use them for? Sometimes you collect some information and at the end of the day, when it comes to, when you uh, come back, you are working on the report, you are doing the analysis, you realize that you don't need some of them. So if you rather consider why you need them, I think you will be in the position to collect the right data. But then even if you collect uh, uh, some of them and you don't need them, well, you can throw them away. That is not a big issue. But then you must always ensure that you need them before you collect them. Request permission. Seek for official channel to collect information. That is very, very important. Don't hide and do things. Say I'm just coming to uh, uh, collect, uh, 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 do interview. And at the end of the day, you'll be hiding and be observing or videoing or taking pictures. No, you must seek official permission before you collect or you do the observation. Prepare carefully before the observation. Draw, plan, draw a plan and a checklist before starting. We said that. Remember that no grade, however sophisticated, will get true story. Yes. The planning you plan, yes. But then remember that sometimes you are working under pressure, and therefore, no matter how detailed you plan, sometimes you may not be able to collect all the information that you need. And that uh, you try as much as possible when you are collecting the data, you must also bear in mind the context in which you are collecting that data. That context must have a bearing on the data that you are collecting. Don't forget to thank the people who allow you to observe. Yes, you may need their help again one day. So you must be uh, very magnanimous in your effort and then make them know that you appreciate your contribution. 
Yes, yeah, secondary data analysis. We come to secondary data analysis. Um, secondary data analysis is a data set collected by a researcher or researchers. And the same data or part of that data assessed by a second person or a researcher who uses that data to support his research without taking part in the initial uh, data collection. In other words, uh, the data you are collecting is already made data. That is to say that it's a research that has been done by a group of person or a person. And that research is the type or you, are, you have embarked on a similar study. And therefore, you may need or you need information from that research to support or to explain or to help you do your research. For example, you, 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 you are doing a research on perhaps uh, 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 the free SHS. And then you have heard that Iris have done a study on free SHS. And therefore, you don't have to struggle all alone trying to do something entirely new. What you need to do is that once you have information, you can approach Iris and ask for the report to guide you, to help you, so that you can get that data, a secondary data to support your research. That is what we mean by secondary data analysis. So the data collected by the researcher who will probably not have been involved in the collection of those data for purposes that in all likelihood were not envisaged by those responsible for the data collection. That is to say that you, you, you are the research that you are doing, you may not know that some people have already done it. But then in the course, you might have heard from somebody, oh, these people have that already done that research. So, okay, in that case, oh, this is an advantage for me. This is a, a good opportunity for me. So you go and then you try to get that research report to help you explain and support your research. That is it. Secondary data is recommended as a good source of data for researchers and students' projects. That is one thing that we need to know. Some of the advantages we can talk of, users of secondary data do not incur costs and spend much time in collecting the data for analysis. No, because like I said, you have started a study and as you struggle to get it shaped and get it uh, well positioned, someone gives you a hint that so so and so have done a similar study. So you move fast to see that person. So in effect, it reduces your cost. You don't even care so much cost. And you don't spend much time with the data, the secondary data that you collect. Then many of the data sets that are used often uh, for secondary analysis are of high quality because they have gone through the mill, that passed through uh, the hands of experts who have read through various suggestions and what are you. So before you get the report, the report is of high quality, and therefore you can trust the source of the data. Okay, so that is that for secondary data. Then uh, the next one we want to consider is documentary sources, which is also one of the secondary uh, uh, data types that we mentioned earlier. Documents are sources of information for social research, and so researchers must be selective in their choice of documents for their research work. In other words, when we talk about documents, they are all over. They are all over the place. And therefore, don't think that any printed 
document, any printed material is a research material that you can use. Yes, that's what we are saying. As they are very good source, but then you need to really closely look at the document, the source, its originality, and then even the authors, where it's coming from before you, 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 you make use of it. Documents serve as important source of data in many areas of investigation. And that's the methods of analysis are similar to those used by historians. Yes, it's a very important source of data in many areas of, yes. There's nobody who can do research without relying on documents or uh, documentary sources. It's very, very important. You need to, you need to. And then especially those who do, who are into history, who want to do uh, historical research. Certainly you need to rely on historical events or past records. So you must necessarily get a reliable document that will help you in that direction. The main difference between documentary research and historical research is that historical research often uses document analysis. Yes, as I said earlier, historical research uses document analysis. That's past events, documents on past events. Past the research, such as descriptive research, uses current documents and issues. The other research types of research, certainly you can't rely only on past uh, documents. Though sometimes you need to rely, use some of the past documents, but then you need to get uh, blend it with what current documents so that it becomes abreast with the current situation. That's why sometimes you write your, you review your literature, you write your work, you send it to your research uh, uh, supervisor, and you tell some of your references are too old. Because if the issue is something that is prevailing, then certainly you must get current information, current documents to help you to present a very current literature. Documentary sources like secondary analysis of data are used to support or explain a prevailing situation of some events or phenomena at a given time. Like I said earlier, when we talk about a secondary data analysis or documentary sources, these are already data, already made data. Therefore, they are usually used to support or explain prevailing situation or to help you to explain uh, your research. So they are very essential. Uh, documents can be categorized as follows. Personal documents can be in a written form, such as diaries, autobiographies, letters, Visual form like photographs are all personal documents that can be used. That's especially if you are doing research and that has to do with a personality that you are researching on or ideas that a personality or philosophy of a personality and you need some personal information. You can look at some of the things, uh, personal documents such as diaries, what he has written in his diaries, you can look for them, especially like an iconic figure like our late president, J.J. Rollins or Atta Mills, or our uh, founder uh, of the nation, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. If you can get access to his diary, autobiography, some of the letters he has written, visual forms or photographs, ah, some of them can help you to get very good information. Official documents which come from the states, as national archives and public institutions, such as policy documents, are also very, very important, essential that you can trust. If they are coming from the states, you can trust the source and their quality. Then official documents which come from private sources, which are usually documents produced by private organizations, are also very important. Uh, some of such documents uh, may carry 
uh, conditions of service and other important information about the work uh, of the organization. Then we talk about mass media outputs, mass media outputs, like the newspapers. Yes, you can also get some reliable information sometimes from them, mass media. But then uh, some of them of late have not approved their work because some do not really uh, do in-depth investigation before they come out with their report or whatever. And therefore, at the end of the day, there are some of them present information that are not correct. So it is up to you, the researcher, sometimes to interrogate some of the material or documents that you lay hand on. Then we talk about virtual output in the form of internet materials. Huh? That is where the problem is. Now everything, everything is on the net. Uh, everything, everybody writes something, he go and dump it there. So if you don't have the eyes or the guts or the skills to interrogate materials, to look at them closely and to find out the source, uh, you just be copying or taking information that are not uh, good for your work. <clears throat> so you must be on the watch out. Okay, then let's look at some of the purposes of documentary analysis and this, uh, it helps to describe prevailing practices or conditions. Yes, when we talk about best practices, or prevailing practices or conditions. Yes, you know, some of them are actually designated for that purpose. Some documents or journals or special documents are meant for um, trying to come out detailing the best practices or conditions under which certain uh, Practices must be done or research or, for example, uh, professions must go about their work. And therefore, if you get such documents, you can trust uh, the quality. Discover the relative importance or interest in certain topics or problems. And then some of the journals or documents also have the interest special interest in certain things and certain topics. And therefore, they try to highlight the importance or the interest in those topics. And for that matter, you can trust that information because if they have special interest in that uh, topic, then you can trust that information they are putting up there is something that you can trust. Uh, they discover the level of difficulty of presentation in textbooks or in other publications or some journals may have their interests or whatever. And then they try to, especially in terms of presentation, if uh, like talking about textbooks, there's certain issues or topic that has been treated and the level of difficulty is such that um, people or students don't usually uh, grab it or understand it they may have interest in trying to take steps to address the situation by trying to find very simple methods of trying to reduce the level of difficulty in that document, such like that it becomes special. Like we talk about in our various schools, we have a lot of textbooks. But then, teachers who teach some of these subjects, especially mathematics, recommend certain textbooks because of the way certain topics have been handled by the experts. They have been handled in such a way that they made it, they brought the level of difficulty to a very minimal level, such that students can read and understand on their own. So, so those are the things. Then evaluate bias, prejudice, or propaganda in textbooks. Yes. And like we said earlier, every researcher uh, has his biases before he even enters into the research uh, situation. We have our prejudices. So some of these prejudices sometimes influence or are brought to bear on our study. And therefore, some journals or documents also have uh, 
the interest at looking at some of these work uh, research reports and then trying to take the pain, the trouble to look at some of these things and see how best they can isolate some of these prejudice, some of these biases, propaganda can be pointed out. Even in our textbooks, sometimes those of us who has are full of politics and what else do, eh? we, 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 we turn those things, prejudice or propaganda into our textbooks here and there. And therefore, at the end of the day, polluting students. Uh -huh. And therefore, some people may have those special interests and try to isolate those things from the realities of the right information that is expected uh, to be provided for the general public to consume. Then, analyze types of errors in students' work. Yes, it gives the, uh, the documents, the writers of the document or people who make such documents the opportunity to analyze these type of errors in students' work, and then uh, as such, it guides subsequent research students or especially uh, risk beginners in research so that they don't make a similar mistakes in their work. <clears throat> then documentary sources, uh, we also want to look at how we can, the criteria that we can use to assess uh, quality of documents. And this has well uh, been done us. Uh, Brahma 2008 has given us some clues as to how best we can um, uh, look at these sources that we assess. The first one is authenticity. Is the evidence genuine and of unquestionable origin, I've said this before, we must always try to go back to authenticate the source of the information. Credibility, is the evidence free from error and distortion? We need to interrogate that. Then representativeness, is the evidence typical of its kind? And if not, is the extent of its own typicality known has its type been seen before? If not, then you need to perhaps sit up and look at it, have a second look. And then the meaning. Is the evidence clear and comprehensive enough? Ladies and gentlemen, I think this is all that we have prepared. And like I said earlier, it is not exhaustive. These are just highlights, a uh, highlight of some of the things that we have presented. And therefore, you need to read, read to supplement what we have. That aside, I know some of our colleagues are also listening. And therefore, in, uh, during question time, some of the things that you may bring up, uh, they may join us to help you to explain them better. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much. Dr. Yash Pire and then Dr. Asari Amon for your insightful presentation. Indeed, you have taken time to research and to help people understand how to conduct qualitative research. So we will, I don't know, since you have just finished presenting, we will read some of the concerns by the participants so that you can respond to them. So somebody's asking, Alfred is asking, so among the three types of interviewing mm -hmm. as a researcher, which will be more appropriate in conducting a qualitative research? Also, how many respondents can be considered as appropriate in conducting qualitative research? Oh, okay. Well, uh, Thank you. In a case of a uh, number of respondents, well, uh, uh, it depends on the focus of your study. We have experts 
who have come out to suggest certain, uh, what do you call it, uh, the number. Raya 2005 suggests, depending on the focus, the purpose of the study. Um, it was of view that um, some researchers are still going to use. Um, he was he, he was working on teacher teacher development and uh, he uh, he used four four and guiding you. Know, I mean each each one. Uh, Hatton and Smith, Silverman. Um, most of the experts um, come out with a number of. Uh, uh, criteria for selecting. However, the basic is about the purpose of your study. What are you looking for? So some researchers don't allow light sample size. What are you looking for? What is the purpose of your study? What do you want to get from your learners? But sorry, sorry, your, your respondents. So um, in qualitative research, yes, uh, Kressler is suggesting some percentages Silverman is suggesting some percentage. Uh, Hatton and Smith, Raya, I mean, they all come out, but the bottom line is about the focus. What is the focus of your study? You want in-depth understanding. You want take description of events. Do you think that the focus of your, your study, um, 100 people can do for you, and one thing is, I want to look at uh, the, the, the interviews and the, the method of data collection. The volume of data that you get, even if you interview someone for just 30 minutes. So, the, 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 the sample, the number of respondents uh, depends on the, the focus of uh, your study. But the second question said, uh, uh, what uh, with the three interview guide, which will be more appropriate for yeah. your study? The first one will say which of the interview guide is appropriate for your study. So it all depends on the type of study you are doing and the type of information that you want to uh, collect. Especially, like we said, um, the structured interview type usually gives the researcher the opportunity to compare and views of respondents or be able to compare the findings. That, that is okay. But then the, 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 and then the, uh, uh, the semi-structured type also gives the, the researcher the opportunity to be flexible in the type of data he collects. And then uh, it, by most at times, um, students prefer to use the semi-structure because um, it gives them the opportunity also to go further for further information in addition to perhaps what uh, they might have gotten or response they might have gotten from uh, the respondent already. It gives that, that, that leeway. That, that aside, uh, the unstructured type two also gives the, uh, the researcher to have access to more detailed, a very big picture about uh, the, the, the phenomena, because like you said, the interviewee here is an aspect that you are soliciting information from. And therefore, it gives you the opportunity for you to have access to all the information that you require. And then you go and sit down and then try to isolate those that are very relevant to uh, the study that you are doing. And therefore, it very often it depends on you, the type of study that you are doing, the nature of your study, and the way you want to go about it. It matters. Okay, so I'll read a few more so I can respond to them. Okay. So somebody's asking, how can we validate qualitative research? And what about its reliability? And then please, is phonology a type of design in qualitative research study or a type of approach in qualitative study? Hmm. And then how, how is data presented in qualitative research? 
I think you can respond to this one. Right. That's the one. In terms of our uh, certain we have what we call a certain, every has its own jargon. We have data trustworthiness and trustworthiness, uh, data authentication and trustworthiness. We will look at reflectivity for uh, the instrument, look at the uh, uh, workability of the instrument. Over here, we, we, we don't, because we, we don't get ourselves involved in those uh, rigorous calculations to authenticate uh, 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 the data that you collect. We have uh, what we call a respondent validation where whatever that you, you, you get from your respondent, you need to pay it back for the respondent to assure you or to, 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 to confirm that is exactly what he or she gave you. And then uh, whether, whether, whether uh, in terms of workability, whether um, the instrument or whatever it is, you it, it's, it's, it's feasible. It can be used at another time. So here, I want to talk about uh, what you call it, uh, validity and reliability. Here we talk about data authentication and validity, uh, sorry, uh, trustworthiness. okay? And then uh, the next question was about uh, how do you present data in qualitative research? Yeah, well, uh, uh, I think there's another session for data analysis and data presentation. However, we'll look at it. Uh, it's about identifying teams and then trying to, uh, I think during uh, uh, that presentation, you are taking through how teams are uh, what do you call it? Uh, identified. Uh, categories, sub teams, and all these are identified, and how uh, they are put together to to to, to report on. That is, uh, but basically, in reporting on qualitative data, we we make a claim. We support the claim with uh, uh, quotations, and then you conclude, and then you discuss. So that's uh, normally um, the general this is that we tend to do. We make a claim, and we support this claim with verbatim quotation from the data that you have. And then we conclude and discuss. These are some of the things that we, this is how we present data. Over there, it's, it's, it's presented in more of what? Uh, the written form, because uh, 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 we use words and then this thing to uh, present our data. It's not, we don't use those hard statistics. And, no, no, no. It does not involve those hard statistics. So that is it. Okay. But, uh, but, but uh, the individual, I think when it gets to data analysis and the data data thing, more insight will be given to uh, our analysis than how it is presented, right? Okay. Okay. So somebody is asking whether we can use inference in qualitative data analysis. Whether we can infer. Ah. Uh, well, uh, what you see uh, in qualitative research, <laughs> what happens is that one of the information that you get is reference to the context within which I did the study. We don't generalize. We don't make this thing. This is about making it because of uh, in quote that subjectivity is about it. So uh, the, the context of really what we did as I said, you make this into that context and not any other thing. But then most of the time, you see students generalizing, making this into the, the larger population. No, it's, a, it's normally reference back to the context within which we did the study. Right. Somebody is asking, what will be the smallest size? Of qualitative research. Small in size. I think I think so, so, uh, uh, small is relative. Someone think I'm small. Someone think I'm like that. However, like I said earlier, on, you see, it, it, getting the, the what do you call it uh, information about your study and that can depend on the purpose. What exactly are you looking for? You know, I, I gave a scenario. Someone exploring. Uh, challenges of uh, what do you call it, uh, teenage, uh, uh, teenage uh, 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 what is happening there? What, what do you want? What is the person looking for? As you, as you, uh, I mean, teenage pregnancy. If it's about cultural dimension and all this that, that will happen, then the person who goes in for what? Uh, no graphic. If it's about getting their living experiences, life experiences, uh, what, uh, what they encounter, the challenges they are facing. They go for what terminology. So, um, and then the focus, uh, depending on, you know, in uh, uh, research, if you're doing a research and you're not careful, you, you become so ambitious. Be before you complete, your, your result will be redundant. 
So it depends on you, the purpose, and then the time frame for your research. And then within that time frame, uh, the purpose and how many people can support you get the information that you want. Okay. Like, I, like I, I said, I did a research using teachers, four teachers. I needed to find out how they can use their own uh, living experience within their own classroom to develop themselves. And my targets were about six months. So it was sort of a, a video sort of what? Uh, a video um, a, a, a kind of study. You videotape your, 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 your performance. You, play, you, you give the, the, the uh, downloaded this thing to you. You look at it and you yourself comment on your behavior for personal development. And I had in mind that I only used for six months. So I worked within the six months. And I used only four teachers. So it depends on the focus. But after reading and reading Raria, uh, uh, Fong, and the rest, they all talk, they, they were talking about to use that strategy, what I think that will come out. And, 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 and their sample size was between four and six. So but in my case, the, the, the subject that I wanted to use, the participant that I went had only four teachers. So I decided to concentrate on the four teachers. So it depends on the focus on the, the purpose of your study. Yes. Somebody, somebody is asking which peculiar situation calls for a qualitative research? When you want in depth understanding about a phenomenon, when you need in depth understanding and you need to get a big description of whatever happens there. You get to understand them and know more about them. The complexity of the data of the program that you are studying. Yes. That's why we use qualitative approaches. So qualitative research, like you said earlier, you, you, you is complex, and that's because of that you can use multiple methods to collect the data so as to enable you capture all the complexity involved in the study. You can use different methods like interview, you can use observation, you can use uh, uh, pictures and what have you, so as to make sure that you portray the right nature of what uh, the information you, you, are, you are taking from the people in the study area. So uh, it, it has to do with uh, the, 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 the detailed nature of the study. Okay. Coordinator, Dr. Tamanja. Yes, well, the, another question is that what kinds of software are available for qualitative data analysis? Mm. And well, then, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, there are a lot of them. Uh, one of the popular ones is in vivo. That's why it's uh, normally used by most uh, what they call it, uh, researchers. But, but there are other complex ones, but the in vivo tends to be um, the common one that we tend to use. The other ones, anyway. How do you report or analyze data since you don't have to use numbers? And then. <laughs> I don't know this question, but uh, uh, let me repeat. It, it, it says about. I am qualitative research. Like I said, uh, 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 a presentation will be made so a few, few, a few, day, a few days to come. But it's about identifying themes, um, getting categories, um, uh, well, categories, soft teams, and then bigger teams. And that's, that's how we do it. And I think when it's time, and then we are taking through, there are so many of them who have, uh, uh, we can use uh, uh, the, 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 the thematic approach, um, we can use a, a, the categories regime, and there, there are so many of them, but I think when it's time, um, it will explain to you next week. But then they're about identifying teams, sub-teams, and categories, and trying to see. And after getting this, uh, this information, that is, one of the things is that uh, uh, the rigorous type, you look through the uh, uh, information, uh, uh, the first thing, the first thing is to transcribe verbatim what about information that you get from your participant? Yeah. And one will be through yes. these uh, uh, responses <laughs> to identify uh, among among the listeners that they are, they are giving out, 
Yes. So we are what we call the coding regime. We have uh, trying to identify the categories, uh, summarize them to the subcategories, and come with our bigger teams. I think in the next week, all these things will be made available to you. It is, it's not about numbers. However, uh, Silverman and the uh, yeah, Silverman was uh, said that you, you can you can use a minimum of this thing. Uh, uh, quantification that's percentages. So we're not talking about uh, what is what is it? Um, bio data and those things. You can use percentage to explain them. But actual actual mm -hmm. uh, this thing, the results that this thing is a systematic approach. So, uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. So the you have to use words like majority or many in interview type of qualitative research. And then if you are using a case study where the multiple case is a prime focus, do you recommend that a respondent of each case be ideal? Uh, what does the mean by ideal? <laughs> uh, the ideal number of uh, sample. You're talking about sample size. Uh, well, with the sample size, hmm. it, 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 it's been a, a, a topic a debate almost always. But then uh, the bottom line is that, like I said earlier on, it's not the focus of your study, your purpose of your study. If, if, if for example, the reason I put up, you, you, if you can identify 10, uh, what do you call it, um, pregnant uh, students, and you think that within the, uh, the environment, within the locality, within the environment where you're doing it, the term is sufficient to you. Fine. Why not? You can use it. You get it. How about a set of fresh uh, material? Vote for more. Uh, more. Uh, more. Uh, more. Uh, more. Uh, more. Uh, majority of what I do. In fact, when, when we are answering or analyzing the qualitative research, because, uh, 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 okay. because we said that at least you have the figures, and uh, oh, yes. if you want to say majority, majority, how many do you mean by majority? Is it 20% of the respondents or 10% or 50%? Those ones you are allowed to, to do that. Like you said, you can use some minimal uh, description statistics and therefore uh, you just don't say majority and minority. What do you mean by majority and minority? So th th that, that is allowed. You can use the percentage to make it very clear. Okay, so somebody so so Seth is asking that with the use of secondary data in qualitative research, what are the ethical issues involved when data is given to a third party who the best, the participants do not know? Whom the participants? Yes, data which are sharing data with the third party. No, no, you 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 collect the data you as a researcher. You, 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 you are the second person here. So you are not sharing with any third party. You take the data to support your research or to explain part of your research. For example, uh, you, you, you are doing a study to look at uh, the learning outcome of students or uh, the, 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 the achievements. So in, in that case, if you want to look at the achievements, you, you need to collect data with respect to uh, some standardized course that is available. It can be test score, not necessarily uh, B, C results, or a C results that is standardized. And you can collect it either from the school or from YET to substantiate your case, your research, to support it. So uh, uh, that's what we mean by secondary data. You are using it to support it, to, to explain <laughs> issues <laughs> as to whether the, the student outcome is good or is bad. So you, you need to do that. And uh, uh, usually, advisable at least, when you are collecting such data, you, because it's outcome, you need to collect at least 
uh, three years in succession, at least three years in succession, that will show the pattern of performance. And that gives a very big picture. So it's not something that you are going to share with a third party. Okay. You know, because that flows, this is the responding. One of the things is to ensure confidentiality. So if you are reporting on all these things, as we all know, and I know it is crucial. Yeah. I know it is very, very crucial. If I can go and stand there at all, he, he, he must say this or no. Mm -hmm. We normally mnemonize. We give them a mnemonics to explain everything because uh, uh, most of the time, when I take uh, samples, we, we need to, because of the qualitative nature of it, because we want to know more about the respondent, we need to give a brief description of that respondent. And then why you are using that respondent, so that's your study. You get it? And, and, and uh, uh, it doesn't require that you mention the name of the, the, the respondent. Because of confidential issue. So just give the respondent any name, maybe teacher one or respondent one, respondent two, respondent three, and that, and that can, we don't mention names. Just to ensure that uh, we don't harm that individual. Very, very, very crucial. Somebody wants to know when you are piloting your, your instruments, who are the target groups? The, the target group, I mean, you are, you are piloting the instruments for a particular study. And that study that you are going to do, you are dealing with people. So you, you, you select exactly the category of people that you are going to deal with. For example, if you, if you are doing a study in Winneba here, that has to do with teachers on perhaps assessments or to know about uh, the, the uh, rate of teacher attraction you want to find out, pilot the, you have prepared your interview garden, whatever you want to pilot. It's the people in Winneber, teachers in Winneber, that will select those that will not be part of the main study. They are the people on whom you are going to pilot the study to ensure that when you go to the field, the uh, instrument you have developed based on the pilot will give you the right feedback as expected. So it is the same category of people that the study is being conducted on, a session of them that you, you pilot your study on. You can't uh, be, uh, your target group is teachers and you go and pilot your instrument on students or on uh, uh, nurses or, no, it, it doesn't work that way. Okay. Somebody's asking if you can share some topics of a typical qualitative research with them. What maybe ne maybe maybe next time we can share that with you mm. next okay. time. Yeah. Yes. So I once again I want to thank you for the time you have prepared and then your insights that you have shared with us all. Prof Kula is Prof Kula around. I'm around. Uh -huh. So can you help us uh okay closing close this since you are the you are the old guy here. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I think that we, we had a very good lecture today. But it seems to me that um, we didn't have our students in science education around. Because usually the problem we have with uh, qualitative analysis is that a scientist, core scientists are saying that it's not reliable because you don't have a quantity of it that you can <clears throat> analyze. But I don't believe that. I think um, it depends on what you are still doing. Even as a science student, you can still use some of these um, elements of qualitative approach in your studies. For example, if you are studying you know, the attitude of scientists in the laboratory. So that is uh, something which you, you can do. But I think uh, the future is going to be mostly in a mixed methods, which uh, I'm sure our experts will be giving in the near weeks to come. But let me say here that um, we are getting more and more popular. I got a message from US saying that uh, well, you people are doing well. 
at the University of Education, Winneba, and I think uh, Iris will continue to, to improve on this. Well, the students are saying that the science students are part of they are, they are with us. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I see. But um, you have not um, commented or given us any question, which I think um, is very important for you to know how you can use a qualitative method sometimes in your research also because many of you you do action research you do participant observer <clears throat> research which um, you do in the classrooms so anyway more will be coming you know in the weeks to come and we will go on learning from each other so i want to thank uh, dr asaremwa and dr yilperi for the brilliant and exhaustive uh, lectures they gave today and i thank uh, all the participants and again i will want to uh, put something on the on the board i will want to mention it again and that is um we at iris especially the coordinator he will want to know the names of people who are with us okay anytime we are having this uh, online lecture I think it's not fair for us to be dealing with uh, something like a 105655 or JB or Infinix Hot 6X and so on and so forth. Let us all put our real names on the screen when we are in this uh, room for the lectures. I think that will help us a lot. So I want to thank everybody for coming and uh, we hope to see you again next week. Thank you very much. Okay, Prof, thank you so much. And thank everybody for being part of it. Uh, since last week, many people requested I will repeat the, uh, the presentation on plagiarism. The presenter has agreed, so we will be scheduling it on the 26th of this month, next week, Thursday. So we'll be on the lookout. We'll make, we'll make the advert available so that, that yeah. can be. But he has asked us to download Zotero and other things so that we can make it more particular. Oh, Thank you, everybody, for coming around. See you again next week.